Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EBA webinar podcast series. This is module six, air sealing requirements and changes in the 2021 IECC. And I'm pleased to present Joe Nebbia as part of uh, this series. He's been with us uh, week after week, and it's just been incredible and informative and educational. So we hope that uh, you'll enjoy it, whether you're watching it here with us live today, listening it to, to it in the podcast, watching this on YouTube or in the EBA Academy. Joe, welcome. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, it's great to be back and uh, talk to everyone again about the code. I love talking about the code. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and I'm always happy to partner with EBA on any, uh, any effort. Um, so I'm thrilled to talk today about air sealing requirements in the code. Um, this is part of an eight module course. So if you haven't taken any of the other modules, I really do recommend going back and taking some of the other ones listed here, they're all uh, um, recorded and, and posted in the EBA Academy. So please do take advantage of that resource. Um, we also have a few coming up as well, if you uh, wanna take, take uh, a chance to come to those live. Today, we're gonna talk about module six. Again, that's air sealing. Next week, we'll be talking about mechanical systems. And then the final module, uh, the following week will be on alternative compliance paths and additional efficiency packages required in 2021 code. So uh, today, as we go through, I always try to, to get a couple of quiz questions in at the end or somewhere in the middle, just uh, so I can kind of gauge how well the information is going across. So while I've got this screen up here, you can go ahead and start to log in. You can't click on the link there on my screen, obviously, it's not a live link. But if you go to slido.com in another window and type that code in, you will be set up in the quiz. And when I get to the right slide, it will just launch in that window for you. Alternatively, you can use your phone if you've got a QR reader and uh, just grab this QR code and get signed in. I really recommend getting signed in now so that you don't have to do it when we get to the quiz time. Um, I've also posted the link, a uh, direct link, so you don't have to type anything in in the chat. Um, so that's a possibility for accessing it as well. It's not graded. You're not going to get a pass or fail or anything on this class, but um, does tell me whether I need to go back over a topic or not. So please uh, take part in that, and it's a way to interact a little bit. If you've got questions, um, one of the EBA staff can pass them along to me during the during the um, webinar. So please type them into the chat or the Q and A. Uh, function in the webinar and get those questions rolling, uh, even if it's, hey, I really hope we talk about this, or if you hear something I say and want to type something in, I'm happy to stop in the middle of it and talk about it as long as we've got time left, of course. Uh, also, I should mention, if you're listening to this as a recording later, uh, the, the quizzes will not be live for you, but you can still hear me talk about the answers. So air sealing and insulation, uh, installation and testing. Uh, so installation of the air barrier and then testing of that air barrier. These are, I would say, the most challenging parts of the residential energy code and have been since 2012. Um, it's not something that you can get by with ignoring and hope you're going to pass. Uh, it, is, it is a challenge. Certainly not these levels that are required in the code. Uh, the best air sealing people are getting around the country, but it's not something you can happen on by accident. Um, so it is important to pay attention uh, to these details if you don't wanna have a, a problem with compliance at the end of your build. So with air sealing, just a, a quick building science reminder, what we're trying to control is convective heat movement. That's where uh, heat is moving uh, with air movement. Uh, so it's not conductive heat movement like we're doing with a lot of our insulation. Some insulation also stops convective heat movement uh, if it's air impermeable. Uh, but that's what we're trying to stop, heat loss because of air movement. So whether it's, it's heat loss from internal to external in the winter, or if it's heat loss, or if it's heat gain in the summer, that's kind of the, the type of thing we're trying to stop with air sealing. It's also important in a humid environment, we're trying to stop moisture moving because moisture wants to move with that air if it's humid air. Um, and so air sealing can, uh, it doesn't solve all moisture movement problems, but it can help uh, with 
moisture movement as well. Uh, some of the tools that you'll see people use uh, for controlling air movement, building paper, caulks and foams, other kind of sealants. Um, if you're using exterior rigid insulation, the, the tapes that go with the seams would be part of that air barrier. Um, insulations that are also an air barrier, like certain spray foams or, or con continuous rigid foam. These are all things that we try to use to help control air movement across the building envelope. Uh, so this chart is a summary of how the air barrier requirements in the residential code have changed since 2009. 2009 was way less stringent. Um, it was actually an option. You could either do the air barrier installation table and follow all those details and have a visual inspection, or you could do a blower door test. And a blower door test for any of you who are, are new to the industry, you haven't done one of these before, you haven't seen them, don't know what it is. It's, it's essentially a, a mechanism that, that you use to either pressurize or more often depressurize a building. And you measure how much air is leaking through the building envelope. And the results, as far as code goes, are usually expressed in terms of air changes per hour at a certain pressure. And so the code stipulates we test at 50 pascals pressure, that's the pressure level of the test. Uh, and we're measuring how many times, how many times the air will change in a space uh, within an hour at that pressurized level. 50 pascals is a pretty high pressure uh, environment, right? Um, so we're not saying that a house is gonna change out its total volume of air seven times in an hour on a normal basis. It's if we pump a whole lot of air in or out, how much is gonna leak out through the, through the cracks and the holes in the building envelopes. So that's very essentially how it works. There's lots of training on, on that go much deeper into a blower door. So in 2009, uh, the code allowed up to a seven ACH 50 house. And, and that was fairly easy to achieve even at the time. But nobody had to do it. You could do the visual inspection if you were sealing all the items on the checklist and you didn't have to test. Um, 2012, that changed. And, and it changed in a big way. First of all, it made both that air sealing in air barrier installation table, which is kind of the checklist. Uh, it made that mandatory and the visual inspection that goes along with it. And also a blower door test was mandatory. So not only are we visually inspecting the air barrier and a bunch of details are required, we also have to test every house according to code starting in 2012. And for most of the country, climate zones three to eight, the air barrier target was three air changes per hour at 50 pascals. For climate zones one and two, southern portion of the country, very southern portion of the country, um, it allowed up to a five ACH 50. Uh, but for most of the country, three ACH 50 was a target. And that was a fairly aggressive target at the time. Again, I know a lot of builders who are going well beyond that now, uh, but for somebody first having to meet a air, air tightness target, that was a, a new thing. And in fact, a lot of jurisdictions around the country amended that uh, requirement as they, if they adopted the 2012. I think Maryland was the first to adopt it unamended and, and remain the only one for quite some time. I'm not totally sure anybody adopted the 2012 unamended other than Maryland. But uh, that, that was a big change in the code. 2015 and 2018, we have the same requirements, uh, both the mandatory detailed checklist and also uh, that mandatory blower door test. And by the way, those targets were also mandatory. So if you were in, let's say, Chicago and you miss the three ACH 50, that was enough to fail you, according to what the, the IECC said. Um, so, so it was a very challenging test because if you miss the target, the house doesn't pass, you don't get your C of O, and you have to go back and air seal a whole bunch of things and, and retest. 
So it's not something where you can say, well, I've got more efficiency somewhere else. Can I refile the plans under performance paths and pass anyway? Um, it's something if you fail, it's going to be a costly mistake. Um, now, in 2021, we've got a, a slight change, and, and it may be important depending on your specific circumstances. And that changes that while the air barrier inspection is still mandatory and the blower door test is still mandatory, the target itself in climate zones three to eight has a little bit more flexibility. Uh, if you're doing prescriptive compliance option, and if you want a reminder on the prescriptive on the compliance pads, please look at module one and then module eight. Um, uh, if you're doing prescriptive compliance option, then you have uh, have to meet that three ACH fifty in most in most cases or lower. It's always three or lower. Um, but if you use one of the performance paths, section four hundred five or four hundred six you actually have flexibility up to a five ACH 50, as long as you can still meet the overall energy performance targets for the house that those compliance paths uh, have. So I don't know how much that's gonna be used. Both of those compliance paths are challenging in their own ways, and we'll talk about those in two weeks. Um, but one big change in 2021 is that there is some flexibility in both performance paths on the air barrier target in climate zones three to eight. It was already five ACH 50 in uh, climate zones one and two. So there's no added flexibility there for those climate zones. Um, but there is a little bit in the other climates. Another option that's been added in the 2021 code is the compartmentalization test. And this is for, there, some of it can be used in any dwelling, but it's primarily driven toward attached product. One of the, the challenges of a volume-based air leakage test is that smaller units tend to have a harder time passing because there's less of a, less, you know, the same amount of leakage in a smaller unit is a bigger piece of the pie. Uh, so that's harder. Also, attached products have for quite some time had an issue where air sealing the common wall between those uh, units tends to be challenging. And so, uh, so it's presented some problems throughout the years. Um, the code now offers two different ways of, of measuring air leakage in some circumstances. Any dwelling, even a single family home, can now be a 0.3 CFM 50 per square foot of dwelling unit enclosure area. So what does this mean? It means CFM is cubic feet per minute at 50 pascals, still the pressure is the same. It, it's a, a measurement of leakage by the surface area of the of the home. So the ceiling, the wall, the floor, all the different nooks in the house, that's kind of that that geometry is going to define your surface area. And and it's a measurement by that surface area as opposed to a volume measurement. So it's a little different way of measuring. And it's how historically multifamily buildings were measured for air leakage before the code requirement came into effect. So it brings it into line with those. That can be used in any dwelling. Um, I, I'm sorry, 0.28 can be used in any dwelling. I'm getting myself mixed up here. 0.28 CFM 50. If you want the higher uh, allowance of 0.3 CFM 50, that's only for attached dwellings, multifamily units that are three stories or less, or um, there's also a small uh, building allowance there too, under 1500 square feet. So um, that may help in some cases that tends to be, it's very dependent on geometry and size, tends to be a slightly easier target to hit than the, than the ACH 50 number, but that's not absolute. Joe, a couple of questions here. Yeah. <clears throat> Does the, was the intent of this in the code to eliminate the small home penalty of the blower door test? Because Obviously, if you had more volume in a house, you'd test right. out better. And is this the better compliance path if you're building those smaller type? For, for that 
yeah, for that 0.3 CFM 54 buildings less than 1500 square feet, that exception was specifically added for the small home Great. issue. And, and it is hard to get to that 3 ACH 50 when you don't have that much volume to begin with. I, you know, I think of something like a 600 square foot, you know, tiny, not that's not really a tiny home, but um, you know, really kind of a smaller unit, you're going to have a really hard time hitting the 3 ACH 50 without really very good air sealing. Right. Uh, second question that came up is enclosure area. How is that defined? Would it be, would it work for slab on grade? Does it look at the basement floor? What volume is it including within the, how is enclosure area defined? Yeah, and, and I'd have to look at the code to see if they've got an extensive uh, definition of enclosure area. Um, I, I don't believe that they do. I, the, 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 um, I could be wrong on that. The, the testing is done based on, a, on several different re, uh, reference standards that you can use, and they would define how you do that. Um, but basement would be included. So right. your, your basement area, but, but homes with basements tend to have less trouble with the volume measurement anyway, because if right. you've got a basement, you've got volume where there's not really a lot of air leakage happening. So yes, the slab on grade would be part of that enclosure area, right? But there's nothing, well, you can have some leakage through there if you've got penetrations and that sort of thing, but it's less. So um, uh, it, the foundation itself does not tend to be what causes you to have issues with volume. It's the amount of space. And then the basement ends up being a little bit easier actually. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so again, this is just another option. If you don't wanna do the five ACH fit or the three ACH or five ACH 50 test, you can do 0.28 CFM 50 for any dwelling, 0.3 for attached dwellings, multifamily and small units. Um, so it's another option. And if you've got somebody testing the house and it doesn't pass the volume, you know, you can look at this as a different way of measuring it and see if it can comply. Um, something to know whether you're doing the CFM 50 or the ACH 50 measurement is you need to know your air barrier if you're going to pass regardless of the target. Um, so one thing that I've always stressed when I talk about this section of the code is if you can't show where your air barrier is on the building plans, you don't know where it is and you're not going to pass your blower door test except possibly by luck. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, you need to know where your air barrier is in order to effectively implement it in the field. Um, so it's important that the details are on the plans. If your air barrier is building paper on the exterior, then that needs to be detailed. And there are certain details that have to happen with that building paper. If your air barrier is using the drywall on the interior, then your air sealing details are gonna look a little bit different. Uh, and if you can't track where that air barrier goes, you're gonna miss something. So that's very important. Uh, it's an important part of planning out a house that's gotta comply with the IECC because of that issue. Now I'm gonna talk a significant amount about specific details that the code calls out in that air barrier installation table. All of these details are mandatory. In the 2021, they don't use the term mandatory. They're all required in all three set uh, compliance paths of the code. So everything I read now has to be done. And if it's not done, that's enough to fail the house until it's fixed. Uh, so keep that's one of the things that's challenging about this. All of these things are meant to get you closer to meeting that lower door test number. In my, in my experience, getting to the three means doing all this stuff and a little bit more or and paying extra close attention to those details. Um, but all of these are required. So one of the main requirements is that the air barrier and the thermal barrier uh, uh, have to be installed in continuous alignment. So there has to be a continuous air barrier and it has to be continuously aligned with the thermal barrier. Now in this example here, you see the green line. If I were to try to make my air barrier um, as it's shown here, it's interior, um, I have an issue 
because my air barrier isn't aligned with the thermal barrier and I have insulation here below the air barrier line, if I just do my air sealing all at this floor level and not at the space below, I haven't aligned my air barrier and my insulation and they're not gonna work correctly together. So it really needs to look something more like this it, or even all to the exterior or a straight line down uh, and then it would be continuously aligned. When they're not continuously aligned, we tend to have issues where air is moving and it's making especially air permeable insulation ineffective. Along those lines, this is the same concept. It's just repeated in a specific detail. Any drop sop soffits and sealing, the air barrier has to be aligned with the uh, insulation. I actually talked about this last week when we talked about installing our insulation. This is kind of the flip side of that. That's it, that the, the air sealing has to be done in alignment with the insulation. So you see on the left here, my uh, beads of sealant marked on the plans are aligned with the insulation, not with the bottom of the soffit where the thermal barrier doesn't exist. Um, so that's a mandatory detail in the code. The attic uh, hatch, there are some insulation requirements. There are also some air sealing requirements that are mandatory. And uh, that part of that is that we have to have um, an air sealing gasket uh, air sealing, some sort of air sealing at the attic hatch. Could be a gasket, could be other means, but typically it's not going to be like a caulked seal because you have to uh, be able to open that hatch. So, um, so a gasket would make sense in that case. But some sort of sealant at any attic access has to be there. Um, if we're using uh, continuous insulation, exterior insulation as part of the air barrier. So the insulation itself is creating part of the air barrier. We have to tape all the joints and seams of that insulation. So now that's also a, a requirement in the installation instructions of most of these products that we tape all the joints and seams, but it's called out specifically in the code. If this is gonna be part of our air barrier, all the joints and seams must be taped. any joints and seams in the air barrier have to be sealed in some way. Um, so in this picture, you see a lot of caulk and some foam. Um, this may be overboard here with all the studs and all the caulk in between them, but they're, they're concerned probably because there's a joint in the, in the sheathing or something like that on the exterior. So they're just sealing everything they can to make sure there's no leak there. The, the top plate has to be sealed. So this is an example where the, the detail is specifically called out, right? Um, the, the, that top plate is an area where we see a lot of leakage so the code says you have to air seal it. Now, it could be that that joint is, is sealed in a number of different ways. You know, it could be an aerosolized seal and it could be caulk. It could be part of a liquid applied air barrier on the exterior. There's a lot of ways you could seal these joints that aren't necessarily just caulking between them, but that's also a possibility. That's a mandatory detail in the code. The sill plate, that joint of the sill plate must be sealed. Um, and, and again, this is an area of, of typical air leakage. It's where we see a lot of blower door tests failing is that sill plate and foundation joint. Um, so on the left, you see they've got um, uh, a product here that's doing some air sealing between the, the um, sill plate and the foundation. On the right, you see there's been no uh, sealing done. And this can be especially problematic because we've got generally a straight piece of lumber sitting on top of um, a foundation that may have some bumps and curves in it a little bit. And so there's a lot of places for air to get in. Um, so there's gaskets, there's foams, there's caulks. Any of these are allowed, but you have to do something there at that joint to seal it. And you really probably won't pass your blower door test if you don't. Uh, one of the additions in the 2021 code 
we got some more flexibility on the on the blower door test number, but there are a number of other details in the air barrier uh, installation table. One of those is that basements, slabs, and vented unvented crawl spaces, excuse me, um, uh, have to be sealed anywhere there's a penetration in the foundation or slab. So again. The code already requires we seal any penetrations, but now these penetrations are specifically called out in case anybody had a question about, you know, if there's a pipe running through the slab or something like that, do I have to air seal that? The code says, yes, you do have to air seal it. Any knee walls um, going from conditioned space to unconditioned space, all of those joints have to be sealed. Um, so on the left, you see a lot of, I think there's some foam there, um, sealing that knee wall up. There needs to be a solid material there, an air barrier material, obviously. Uh, and we may need to make sure there's no gaps uh, between those spaces. Window and door jams, uh, those must be sealed and they cannot use air permeable insulation. So on the right, we see, um, that's actually on the right, that's not the, the jam, that's, that's part of the frame that's been sealed, but that's okay. Um, on the left, we see uh, a area around the window where the gap has been sealed, sealed with fiberglass. Now this is something that you see quite commonly, right? Pretty much every window installer who's ever come into my house has tried to do this with windows. It's just how it happens. And what they do is they go around and they cut all these tiny strips of fiberglass and they stuff them around the window. And first of all, it's not insulating anything, right? Because uh, when you compress fiberglass, it no longer has any insulating uh, um, properties at that point. So, it's not stopping any heat flow through conduction. And air and fiberglass is an air permeable insulation, which means air is going to move through it and it's not stopping any air leaks. So this is an unsealed joint right here and it needed to be sealed according to code. That's enough to fail a house. I don't know why people do it this way because it's way more work, right? To cut all those strips of fiberglass and stuff them all around definitely takes more time than using a tube of caulk. It just does. So for whatever reason, they do this. It's not allowed by code. It hasn't been allowed by code for many, many years. Um, so if, if you're a window installer and look at this, please don't do that. And if you're a builder, don't let your window installers do this because it doesn't, it's not allowed by code. It's not doing anything. It's wasting material. And, uh, and it's not how you want to air seal that space. Here's just a few other examples of fiberglass stuffed around windows and doors. One addition to the code that kind of goes along with this is that we already know we have to cut bat insulation to fit a narrow cavity. Can't just squeeze it in there. We have to cut it to fit because we don't want to compress it. The code now points out that if you've got a space that's, I'm looking at my slide here, that says greater than one inch, but it's a space less than one inch is what it's supposed to say. So if you have a space that's less than one inch, uh, the code now says you can air seal it instead of insulating it. And that makes a lot of sense because there's not a lot of insulating products other than a spray foam or something like that that's going to go in there and air seal and insulate um, that you can really realistically use in a less than an inch cavity. So the code now specifically says that, but it says it must be air sealed. So if you're looking at this recording, please note that that's supposed to say less than an inch on the slide there. Rim joists must be sealed. Um, so they must be insulated. They also must include the air barrier. So you can't skip the rim joists and the air barrier even if you're in a floor over unconditioned space. Code says all rim joists must be part of the air barrier. So even if you're not insulating the basement below, you can't, 
define your air barrier above that space. That rim joist has to be insulated, it has to be air sealed. Um, and if you, this was a floor over unconditioned space, you would see insulation there in the floor as well. Doesn't have to be spray foam as in this example, um, a rim joist, the air barrier could be the rim joist itself as long as all of the seams are sealed. 2021 adds some new details to the rim joist requirement. It includes the exterior air barrier um, and uh, the rim board and the sill plate junction have to be sealed and the rim board to the floor, subfloor have to be sealed. This is how you would seal it anyway, but it's giving specific details to how you seal that assembly. An air barrier has to be uh, installed at the exposed edge of any floor insulation. So we can't have unexposed floor insulation in a floor over unconditioned space, according to this. This is, um, this is a requirement in the code, it's mandatory. So if you've got an exposed edge of insulation, the floor at the floor, the, uh, the air barrier has to be installed there. Anywhere where you've got a uh, duct shaft uh, penetration of any kind for utilities, uh, for, for flues or pipes or anything like that, that's penetrating the thermal envelope, that has to be sealed. An addition to the 2021 IECC is that that detail that we just talked about has to be um, sealed to, in a manner that allows for expansion and contraction. The code doesn't give really much more detail than that. So it's a little vague there on what's required, but uh, I think the concept generally is that you couldn't have a sealing material that wouldn't allow for any expansion and contraction. You know, if you've got materials that have hot and cold air going through it, if you've got pipes, these, anything like that, code says it has to allow for expansion and contraction, those sealing materials. Joe, we just had a question come up. Uh, on the rim joist exterior, yes. that means the interior side of the rim joist, but alternatively, you could insulate the exterior of the rim joist as well. Is that right? You could, yeah, you could, you could insulate and air seal there um, on the exterior of the rim joist. So you could have totally um, continuous rigid foam to the exterior, as an example. Um, and, uh, and sometimes those are even going to go below grade if your slab edge insulation is rigid. And then all of your insulation for the rim joist is there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then it, it does say, though, that it has to still be sealed to the sill plate and the top and the, and the bottom of the floor, that's probably going to be done on an interior basis. That's probably the easiest way to do it, but, um, you know, it, it, um, I guess it could be done, mm, probably going to be done on an interior basis, that specific detail, but the, the rim board could be insulated there. Thank you. And do we have one more come in? I think that was the most recent okay. question. Okay, got it. So all penetrations through the envelope must be sealed. Uh, on the left, you see that, you know, big hole with the wire going out of it. Hopefully that was caught before the home was finished up. Um, and then on the right, you see uh, wires going into an attic space uh, and, and that needs to be sealed before uh, the air barrier inspection because you could have air leaking from the attic uh, into the space, into the conditioned space. Uh, conditioned space and garages, that junction has to be air sealed. So here we see spray foam between those spaces. Doesn't have to be spray foam. It could be solid blocking with caulking or something like that at all the joints but that those junctions do need to be sealed. We don't wanna have a situation here where we've got a floor cavity and the, the garage is cold and the inside is heated and we've got air just moving in between those two spaces through the floor cavity. So you have to have some sealing there. 
lighting, if the recessed lighting penetrates the thermal envelope, so top floor going into the attic, that sort of thing, uh, pretty common. Uh, you have to have sealed fixtures. The insulation section also requires that they're IC rated, insulation contact rated, right? If they're gonna come into contact with insulation. Uh, have to have sealed fixtures. So that's the fixture itself is sealed. And then the light has to be sealed to the finished surface. Um, so what that means is it's not just that you're buying a sealed can or an airtight can here. So you have that labeled uh, in the can itself. That's one step. And then the next step is that the, the light itself has to be sealed to the finished surface. So the drywall, the ceiling there um, has to be sealed. That's mandatory. Uh, behind uh, tubs and showers uh, on exterior walls. So interior walls, we're not so concerned about it, but behind tubs and showers on exterior walls, uh, the air barrier has to be uh, at the exterior wall. And it has to be, uh, it has to separate the wall from the sh shower or tub. So the thing they're trying to avoid there is having any kind of air movement behind that, that tub space. Um, also behind electrical boxes, um, if you have a exterior air barrier, so it's, you know, on the outside of the building, then that satisfies this requirement. But the code says if you, if you don't have an exterior air barrier behind electrical boxes, then all the boxes have to be sealed. So what we're trying to avoid there is a situation where let's say we've defined our, our air barrier interior. So it's drywall and, and caulk at the edges and all that. There could be a significant amount of air coming through these holes in electrical boxes. And it's typically a big place of leakage. Uh, so then you have to seal those boxes. In this example, they've actually caulked all the little uh, openings. They also sell uh, boxes that are gasketed or they're a sealed uh, electrical box in some way as a package. Uh, so that would be allowed. Or you could just have your air barrier behind, behind all of the electrical boxes. Anywhere where you have a, a, a duct register boot um, penetrating the thermal envelope, you have to have that uh, sealed to the subfloor. So um, this is gonna affect both your duct blaster test, your test on how tight the ducts are and your blower door test if you don't seal this joint. Often what I've seen is that this ends up being a scope of work issue. So, you know, in this case shown here, we've got mastic sealing it to the floor. And that was because the HVAC contractor did it, right? And they have the duct mastic they were using. Sometimes you see this unsealed and the HVAC contractor says, well, that's the carpenter's job. And the carpenter says it's the painter's job. And the painter didn't think anything except painting was their job. And so in that sort of a situation, clearly defining who's responsible for what air sealing among the subs can help uh, avoid a problem where you've got a, an unsealed um, point that has to be sealed according to code. Fire sprinklers. I know this is a really popular topic among anybody building houses, Fire sprinklers have been required by the IRC since 2009, but they're not adopted in many states, right? It's usually amended out. So this may not apply to many of you. I think Maryland and California, still the only states that have adopted it statewide. Sorry if I'm missing anybody. Um, but for people who are not in those states or for people who are in those states, and uh, if, the, if you're in those states or if you're building a home with fire sprinklers because it meets a size requirement or you just wanted to put it in or the customer wanted it, um, there are some air sealing requirements that go along with that. Um, so you have to seal all the penetrations in the envelope, right? The problem is for specific kinds of fire sprinklers, you can't seal them 
in the traditional way because it will prevent them from moving and some of them have to move to function. So for pendant heads, this doesn't tend to be a problem. You can actually seal the joint at the, at the finished surface on pendant heads. But for concealed sprinkler heads, they actually move, right? As part of their function, they're gonna drop down in order to actually function as a fire sprinkler. Um, and they need to be able to do that. You can't stop them from moving. So the code says they have to be sealed, but they can't be sealed in a way that stops them from functioning. Most of the fire sprinkler manufacturers have specific products designed for air sealing. So this is an excerpt of, of one fire sprinkler um, that has um, a gasket that essentially fits around the fire sprinkler, sprinkler so that when it's closed, there's a seal, but it's not a permanent seal. So it can open and close uh, without being prevented. If you were to caulk that fire head, it wouldn't be able to open and close. And that would be a violation of code. So uh, if you've got concealed heads that have to be able to move, keep in mind that you need to look for whatever product the manufacturer has to be able to seal that head because you are gonna get some air leakage there and it may be the difference between passing and failing that blower door test. Uh, so, so look and see if they've got something like this gasket that's designed to be able to move. Um, fireplaces have to have tight fitting doors or dampers. Um, so either one of those, the damper can be tight fitting or the doors can be tight, tight fitting. They have to have outdoor combustion air. And if they are tight fitting doors and they're a factory built model as a lot of these uh, uh, fireplaces are now, they have a specific UL um, listing they have to meet. Um, you can still have a wood burning fireplace in a home that's built to three ACH 50. It's allowed by code in 2021. You can have it, but you have to do these things. It also does take some careful design, right? Because it's not gonna quite draft the same way it did in that seven ACH or 10 ACH 50 house. Uh, so keep that in mind if you are installing one of these. Rooms with fuel burning appliances is a section in the, in the air barrier uh, section of the code that has been there since I think 2015. And it's a little bit hard to comply with, uh, or I should say it, it takes a lot of detail and cost. Um, so this is for climate zones three to eight, and it only applies in certain situations. If you have an open combustion appliance, so that's a atmospherically vented appliance. It's one of the more, um, of the less efficient uh, appliances usually. So it's pulling its combustion air from the room and it's venting in an open air manner. Uh, so it's not power vent and it's not direct vent. If you've got one of these appliances, which is still allowed by code, um, and if you don't have enough combustion air in the space to supply that, uh, and the IRC defines how much combustion air you have to have. So if you go to the IRC and you find, I've got this in a utility room in a basement, I don't have enough air to supply it, and I have to bring in outside air. So if I've got an open combustion appliance and an open air duct supplying the combustion air, then that entire room has to be sealed off according to the code. Um, it has to be all penetrations in and out have to be sealed. The walls of that room have to be treated as if they're an exterior wall insulated. The door has to be a, uh, an exterior door. It's gotta be gasketed. Um, so there's a lot of cost that will go into it if you have one of these open combustion appliances and are having to bring in that open air duct. It triggers this section in the code, which makes you turn in what used to be essentially a closet into a full exterior wall. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. And the effect of this provision in the change is in the code is that in, in jurisdictions that have adopted this code, the open combustion appliances are essentially going away. 
because it's cheaper to put in a, a sealed combustion appliance um, than it is to do all of the detail work in this room around, around that appliance. And you get the extra efficiency benefits of going for the better unit anyway, and it's better for air quality. So it's moving building in a good direction, uh, but the mechanism is very expensive if you don't wanna take those steps. And again, that's mandatory only when these conditions apply. Now, for any, anyone who builds townhouses or, or other attached products in a state that's adopted the IECC and has this three ACH 50 target, you'll know that this is a very hard target to meet for townhouses. Even builders doing very efficient, very innovative, leading edge type building, uh, getting to three ACH 50 on, on these common walls, uh, with, with these common walls between units tends to be a challenge. Part of the reason is that it tends to be a leaky part of the assembly. Um, another part is that there's not a lot of clarity in how you air seal these without violating the fire rated assembly. So um, a lot of firewalls, so the, the fire rated assembly between the, the um, townhouses have specific attributes and a lot of them have like a, an air gap, for example, that's part of that structure. Um, and if that air gap gets filled with, as shown here in the lower middle, um, what's essentially fuel put in there to stop the air leakage, um, it's unclear how that firewall is gonna behave. Um, likewise, if you cover the breakaway clip, um, there, it's unclear how the breakaway clip is going to behave. Um, if you caulk instead of foam, is that better? There, there have been a lot of questions, and in the jurisdictions that adopted the air sealing requirements early, uh, townhouse builders have been kind of scrambling for a number of years. Um, uh, part of it is that, you know, one jurisdiction will say, well, I'll let you foam it, but don't cover the breakaway clip. Others will let you picture frame foam that whole cavity. Others will say no foam whatsoever. Some will say no caulk because it's not in the rated assembly. Uh, there are a number of groups working to solve this issue. Um, there have been some breakthroughs recently where uh, parts of the industry have gone in and they've retested fire rated wall assemblies with specific foams and sealants in the assembly to show that they will perform. And so those are now as five to seven, something like that, different firewalls that are now in the UL uh, database that have sealants in them now. So we're moving towards solving this problem. The code in the IRC has also um, allowed more engineering uh, approaches to the, to the firewall. Um, uh, in the 2021, 2018 code, uh, there's some more options there, but it's still kind of a tension between the codes. We have to have fire safety. We have to have air sealing. Neither one of those requirements is saying you can do one and the other says you can't do it. It's because they're performance-based uh, as far as air sealing goes, right? But it's hard to, to meet the blower door test without sealing this wall. Now, the other thing that will help is that uh, the CFM 50 per square foot of enclosure area. Uh, it's easier for a townhouse to get to that target than it is to get to the volume target. And so a lot of them, I think, are gonna use that target, especially if they're on the borderline of passing. But uh, if you haven't done any townhouses that have been had to be sealed real tight, keep an eye on this, make sure you're communicating with your local jurisdiction to find out what they'll let you do in that fire uh, space. For windows, we talked a lot about the walls and the insulation. There are air sealing requirements. I talked a little bit about this in the window requirement section, but I'm going to repeat it here because it's actually in the air barrier section. Um, all windows installed per the IECC must have a air leakage of, it's actually 0.3 uh, or lower. So it, on, on that um, NFRC sticker, it has to have a 0.3 or lower for that air leakage number. It's often not tested in windows. 
um, but it is mandatory. So here on the right, you see a dash. That's because it wasn't actually tested in the window. That's allowed to still get the NFRC sticker, but it's not allowed by code. So you need to make sure that your windows, if they're going in somewhere that's adopted the IECC, it's got to have that air leakage test on it. And it's got to be lower than 0.3. Here's just a, a quick couple of pictures of consequences of leaky windows. This is, this is air leakage through the window itself. Um, it's not, and it's a tested value in the factory. So you're not testing in the field. Uh, it should be a labeled uh, thing. But if you've got, especially in a humid environment, if you've got air moving through, you're gonna have moisture and you're gonna have all sorts of problems in your window if, they're, if it's very leaky. So one of the things I always get asked when I do these classes, and it used to, of course, be in person, but now everything's virtual, um, is aren't we building houses too tight? And the answer is, of course, we're building them too tight. We're building them way too tight. But let me explain what I mean by that. We're building them way too tight to not control our fresh air. So I'm gonna talk next week a little bit more when I talk about mechanical systems that are options for ventilation. But regardless of what code your jurisdiction has adopted, not mechanically ventilating your space is not an option. And what I mean by that is it's negligent to build that way. So we often think of the code, the code in 2012, when it introduced the three or five ACH 50, depending on where you were in the country, also introduced a, a requirement for homes that were, uh, in 2012, it said uh, less than five ACH 50, 2015 and 18, it said five ACH 50 or lower. So if you hit five exactly on the dot, you can't get out of it. But anyway, five ACH 50 or lower had to mechanically ventilate, whole house mechanically ventilate the home. Um, and the reason for that is if we're going to build houses tight, we have to bring in fresh air. Um, we as humans need fresh air to breathe. So one question I get is, well, why don't we just make the houses looser? And the answer is we can't. So what I've, I've shown here is just a general picture of how um, the ACH 50 numbers work and where this perceived danger zone is. You know, we, we often, people often think, okay, the code says five ACH 50 or lower. That means that's what I have to, that's where the danger is. And if the code's amended to allow me up to six ACH 50, then I don't need ventilation. Well, that's not really true. So the, the code, um, in order to get enough fresh air for us as humans to breathe, um, we really would need something like a 10 ACH 50 if we're talking about average annual. And again, this is for an average home, average size, that sort of thing. We'd need about 10 ACH 50 on an average annual basis. If we wanna be able to breathe fresh air on an average weekly basis, we'd really need something like a 14 ACH 50 house. So what does that tell us? Has anybody on, I don't know, you don't really have a way to answer, but I don't know if anybody out there has built something worse than 14 ACH 50 in the last 30 years. Um, the answer is we started to get too tight long time ago when we started sheathing our houses for structural reasons. We're trying to make people a little bit more comfortable not having as many drafts, um, got better windows. We don't build houses loose enough that they can breathe on their own. And we're not able to. Even houses that fail the blower door test aren't failing at 14 ACH 50 new construction. They're not. Uh, so whenever anybody says, can't we just make the house leak or leakier? I say, no, you really can't. So we're building it tight anyway. We're saving energy by doing so. So we have to ventilate. That's really the only option. People don't open their windows. Windows aren't aren't a trade-off against mechanical ventilation. They never have been. Um, I'm certainly not gonna open my windows this week when it's 12 degrees outside. I'm not gonna open my windows when it's 100 degrees and 90% humidity. I'm just not gonna do that, right? And that's how most people are. 
So we have to ventilate in order to get fresh air. There's not really another option. Um, so it's my little soapbox on, on ventilation. And we'll talk about your ventilation options in the code next week. But one more addition, the 2021 IRC no longer says 5 ACH 50 or lower. It says if you're meeting the air ceiling requirements of the IECC. So this business of, well, we'll change the target to six and we'll change the trigger to three ACH 50 that some jurisdictions did, that goes away in the IRC unless you really wanna change the intent of the code. It says, if you're building to the IECC, you have to ventilate. And it's really the only responsible way to build. Now uh, we have about five minutes left. I'm gonna go into our question portion. Please feel free to type your questions in. Uh, if you do have any, if anything I said has been confusing, um, or if you just have a question and I'm gonna launch these Slido polls. If you've already logged in, again, that QR code was there. It will pop up on the screen as well if you haven't logged in yet, but um, uh, I do hope that you'll participate in the quizzes. So the first question here relates to this picture and whether it shows uh, correct air sealing between the uh, garage and the, un the unconditioned space and the conditioned space. And you can answer as soon as you are ready. It should be popping up on your phone or on your whatever window in your browser you have open, but if you don't, you can access it there with the QR code. So we've got lots of participants coming in. I'm going to give just a little bit longer on this one just because it's the first one. If you want to participate. Okay, so the answer is, I think this is kind of opinion based, is correct or not correct. From my view, this is correctly sealed. It's got solid blocking in the, the floor cavity there. You've got uh, caulk and foam at all the different seams. I think this is well sealed. Um, if I got closer, I might see some, some gaps. But going on to the next question, what air sealing mistake is shown here? And there's only one right answer here. Um, so see if you can pick the right answer. By code, what air sealing mistake is shown? Okay, yes, everybody got it. The lighting is not sealed to the finished surface. What air sealing mistake is shown here? Hopefully everybody remembers this one. Okay, lots of answers. Oh yes, I should have mentioned that there were a couple of correct answers and everybody's getting them. Uh, air permeable insulation is uh, being used as part of the air barrier, that's correct. And the window jam is not sealed. Both of those are correct. Next question, climate zones three to eight in the 2012 to 2018. So discounting the 2021 right now, what is required as far as the air barrier? Only one of these is correct. Okay. So yes, mandatory air sealing details and three ACH 50 blower door or less. 2009 was the only time when you could do either inspection um, or a blower door test. Um, you've always had to do the visual inspection of those details. For climate zones three to, 20, three to eight in the 2021 IECC, uh, what is allowed as far as compliance. And there are actually several different options that are allowed here.
And I know we're just about at three o'clock, but if you went, want to hang on, there's a couple more questions here and I do want to answer any questions that people have put in if we have time at the end. So most people are getting the right different answers. Um, we can do an air, we can go up to five ACH 50 using one of the performance paths. We've got the different uh, CFM 50 numbers that are allowed. Uh, there's the, the standard 3ACH50 in pre prescriptive, but uh, we still have to do a blower door test and the air barrier detail. So that was the only incorrect one. Final question here. You know, I didn't cover this. So I'm going to just tell you the answer. Is building paper always an air barrier? You can go ahead and guess as I talk about it, but uh, most of you probably know this. Sometimes it's actually installed as a weather barrier only. And there's different instructions based on whether you're installing it as an air barrier or a weather barrier. If, you, if you're using it just as a weather barrier, typically it says to leave the, or at least has last time I checked, leave the bottom unsealed, untaped, because you want any water that gets it behind it to run out. But if you're using that building paper as the air barrier, it needs to be taped. So the answer is no, it's not always uh, going to be an air barrier. It can act as an air barrier if it's installed in a certain way. So those are all of the questions we've got for this. Uh, Aaron and Nancy, I don't know if, if you have any questions you want to read here at the end. Yeah, we had one uh, great question that just came in, but how does all of this relate to remodeling versus new construction? That's a great question. Um, all of these practices, the details that you see, um, are, are great things to do in any kind of remodel. So if I've opened up a wall cavity and I see all these penetrations in and out, I wanna seal those while I'm there. Um, and, and the joints that tend to leak between new and existing are things that we wanna seal up. There are a couple of considerations for a code standpoint. Um, it's, it's a little murky. The code historically has technically required blower door test for additions, for example. If you read it strictly, it requires it for additions. I don't know any way to blower door test an addition that's just a, a big bump out. You know, if it's, if there's a, a one doorway leading into the addition, maybe you could blower door test it. Other than building a temporary wall, blower door testing, and then taking the wall down, or testing pre and post and trying to extrapolate, it's very difficult. And most jurisdictions I talk to don't enforce that on additions. Some do. Um, it, it's very tricky though. So the code does require it, but it's typically not enforced. So that's something I would ask my building official. Are you going to make me blow or test this addition ahead of time? It's a great question. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, is if you're tightening up the house significantly during a renovation, do you have the ventilation to handle it? Now, as I said before, your house probably needs ventilation anyway, um, but it's definitely, it's doubly important if you're tight, tightening up the house more. Yeah, I like what you said about um, thou shalt mechanically ventilate <laughs> nine homes. Yeah. Uh, it's That's great. great. It's well, I'm happy thing. to answer more questions or if we're, you know, if you feel like we're out of time, I'm, we can cut it off, but I know there's. No, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, if you've just completed module six, we look forward to you joining us in module seven, either online uh, recorded or in person on Tuesday, January the 18th at 2 p.m. Central. So Joe, we look forward to seeing you next week. Great. Thanks a lot.